I think it was very, um, but 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 interesting, interesting guy, and you didn't know where he was coming from, except that he loved uh, investigative uh, material and and started the invest uh, started the Bureau of Investigation, and later became the Federal Bureau, and he went and lobbied for uh, arms so they could be regular policemen, and. Um, and it, and it just sort of materialized, and 48 years later, he was still doing it. I, I didn't know a lot, and when when my agent told me it was about Hoover, I thought he was talking about the president. Um, then we, um, you know, he explained who it was, and I knew of him, but I certainly didn't know that he was this um, suspicious character who did a lot of terrible things. I didn't know that. Um, like you said, I. I it's American history, and um, I grew up in England and Australia, so I just wasn't connected to it. Um, I d had to do a lot of research, obviously. A lot was there on the page, but then you go into... Uh, they thankfully sent me um, this fantastic kind of package of um, DVDs, you know, all kinds of um, things taken from YouTube. Um, there, there's been quite a few documentaries made, um, a lot of literature available. What was interesting and fascinating for me is the take that Dustin Lance Black had as a, from a writer's perspective on J. Edgar Hoover's life. Because I, I knew about J. Edgar Hoover. There was a project very early on that I was involved with where I looked into his past and his history and, and sort of understood, I, I suppose, who he was on a very peripheral level. But he, he dug very deep in this screenplay. He made me understand his motivations for the first time, who he was on a personal level, this, the idea of sacrifice and what it is to be of service to your country and sacrifice any personal relationship, any family life for the service and the good of, of your country. And that is a, a pretty hard thing for me to wrap my head around and most of us as, the, as actors try to understand this concept. What, it is, what is it to say, you know what, I'm almost joining a priesthood here, and the FBI is my church, and what is important for the FBI is important to me, and if that means not having any personal life, that means not having any personal life. And understanding the motivations of his mother and how she was this strange stage mom in a way in the world of politics. She wanted her, her son to be um, rise to great glory and fame in the world of politics, and he lived with her until he was 40 years old. I mean, this is a very bizarre figure in American history, but a man that held a position of power for eight different presidents for over 50 years. His power was unchecked, and his belief system from the 1920s carried on all the way to the 1960s. It's a fascinating portrait of how absolute power corrupts absolutely, and how if there aren't great checks and balances in our political systems, things can go awry, because he did some very detestable things towards the end of his life. Well, we found out that he, uh, you know, there was always a lot of controversy, a lot of rumors uh, about him because he was a solitary guy, or he, he trusted not too many people. Obviously, Clyde Tolson was his inseparable friend, and, uh, and, and Helen Gandy was his uh, loyal assistant, and uh, they had, um, and she was with him the whole time, and they sort of all grew up together, or grew old together. And they, uh, and he did a lot of, he manipulated a lot of things around to, to work for him. And I guess he had to manipulate in the political world, which was kind of tricky. But he managed to stay there. And he, uh, a lot of people I've talked to thought he was a very uh, affable person, very uh, pleasant to work with. And a lot of people thought he was a son of a bitch. <laughs> and so it just depends on what side of the law or, or him that you, you, were, you were on. It seemed like he was sometimes tough on people that had done well uh, there. He seemed like that he, he took most of the glory for, for um, things that were going on with the FBI and, and their successes. And uh, I don't know if he took the glory on, on any failures or not. But he, he, even after doing the picture and reading all the books that Lance Black had read to, that, to get the information, uh, I, I, still, uh, I still think of him somewhat as a mystery, mystery man. 
I think you see the, the relationship between him and his mother and being such an important one and kind of dysfunctional, um, very dysfunctional, <laughs> um, over, overbearing mother, but also an inspiration to him, like who, who I mean, good and bad influences, I think. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, you're wondering if they're gonna, there's gonna be any romantic um, life between them and it's not who he is. And does she want it? Maybe, but I think what we worked out was that she really wanted to be someone um, who worked for her country to be in service. And um, any admiration that she may have had for him, you know, from the heart sort of probably fizzled out and, and became about her career. And, and I think she must have been invested in him personally um, in a protective way for her to go that far. Um, but yes, also honor her, her, her job, which was to serve her country and, um, and keep those secrets. And, and actually, with one thing that I did stumble across was the transcript of her testimony um, that I managed to get hold of from the Library of Congress. And, and it was, you know, quite impressive to see how she held her to, to her word right until the bitter end, um, into her 80s, you know, five years after his passing. So these are two guys who had a very strong bond and um, you know they had a very complicated sort of relationship you know I you know I think Clyde for J Edgar was the guy who got through his sort of I am the director and treated him like a human being and didn't let him get away with anything and challenged him in a way that nobody else could and that in a way sort of wanted J Edgar to shove away Clyde but at the same time he had to have him close and um, you know I think for Clyde there was just apart from having a tremendous amount of respect for the man and seeing what it is that he's capable of, uh, there was a thing in J. Edgar that Clyde knew that was very similar to what he had in himself, and he just wanted to be able to make Edgar comfortable enough to be able to say, I feel these things, I acknowledge it. Clyde, please, like, accept this. And that's all Clyde wanted. And I think, I think he never really got a full culmination of that, but the kiss at the end on, like, the forehead, I think, was, was like... I would have waited another 40 years for that kind of thing, you know? But the hard one was trying to find information about Helen Gandhi. I mean, her whole job was to be in the background. She wasn't in the foreground, which obviously Hoover was. Um, so trying to piece together the little bits of information that were available was, was tricky. Um, you know, there wasn't much focus on who she was as a person and did, does she have... Um, a personal life and what's her feeling about him. There wasn't opportunities so much um, to put that on the screen, but yeah, certainly interesting information for me to try and find out or make up if I can't find it out. It was great. I mean, it was, I got to dig so much deeper and there's so much more that you can find when it's a real person at a real time in a real place as opposed to someone that a writer came up with in their head. You know, both have their advantages because, you know, if it's if it's not a real person, you can sort of fudge and create whatever sort of backstory you want for your character. But, but this was great because I got to go, okay, what was life like in 1902 when he was born? What was it like in 1927 when he got hired? What was it like in this year? And like, what was going on in the time? And it, like, it gave me so much more stuff to dig through, which was a lot of fun. Uh, just the story, the scre screenplay. I like the, the screenplay. It was, uh, it, uh, Rob had it on his desk. Uh, he says there's an interesting story about Hoover. And I said, when, is this President Hoover or, or what? And he said, no, J. Edgar Hoover. I said, oh, yeah, great. And having grown up with J. Edgar Hoover, uh, uh, because he was there all of my lifetime, uh, he was always the head of the FBI. And... Um, so I thought that'd be interesting. So I went home and read it. Sometimes when you pick up a script, you just uh, instinctively feel it might there may be something hidden in there between the pages. And so I, w I went home and read it, and I, I really liked it. So I called up uh, Brian Grazier, who had given it to us, and uh, I said, um, uh, "What's the matter? Universal doesn't want to do this because he's tied up over there." And he said, well, they're, you know, in a position where they weren't quite sure what they, they wanted their next move was. And um, so I said, let me take it to Warner Brothers. So I took it over to Warner's and, and, uh, and then, then Leo uh, called up and expressed interest in, in the project. 
and because he had read it. Um, and so everything just fell in together. Then all of a sudden there we were with Leo. And then, uh, so we just, a couple weeks later, we were preparing it. Well, we did, we did the younger sort of Hoover years for the first uh, month, and a month and a half. And then we had a couple weeks towards the end where I got to make the transition into the older J. Edgar, which was uh, very beneficial for me, having sort of lived his life out as a young man. And then we went through this you know, sort of rigorous makeup process for five, six hours a day uh, to transform, and, and to also have the weight, not only on a physical level of J. Edgar Hoover, but the weight of that many years of experience. So, you know, to do a scene where I'm speaking to a young Robert F. Kennedy and calling him a young man and, you know, a little whippersnapper and you're still wet behind the ears, it was very beneficial for me to be able to play out the early years. Um, but it was very claustrophobic towards the end, you know. You almost have to slow your heart rate down and slow your movements down and um, change who you are on a physical level. Um, I, I can't say I enjoyed it. It was incredibly challenging. And like I said, I wanted to, I wanted to tear this makeup off every single day and sort of break through. But it was, um, it was, um, it was incredibly important to show that transition in J. Edgar Hoover, to see what he became, this political dinosaur that just held on to his political beliefs for way too long. Yes and no. Like, um, it was never not fun, but sometimes, like, I would want to have more fun than I probably should have been having, just going, Clint Eastwood, man, this is awesome! You know, and, like, sort of getting lost in it all. But, um, but Leo was great for that because, you know, as soon as Clint would say stop or cut or whatever, boom, Leo would go right back to his script, like, putting his head right back into it, getting back in that, working on the accent, working on the diction, all that stuff. So then I'd, you know, be like shooting the breeze with like Bruce the grip who worked on Goonies. Like, tell me about that thing. Oh man, that's great. And then like look over at Leo and be like, oh right, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I have to focus now, you know. So that was great. He just knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants. He's very quick to get it. I mean, I can't believe how quickly he works. Um, it, it's great for an actor because you've, you're always on your toes. Um, and a lot of the time, sitting around on the set, you get you lose focus because it's hours in between lighting setups and what have you. Um, but with him, you know, 10 minutes is the most you'll ever wait. Uh, so that's great. And I think that must be because he's, he is an actor and he, he doesn't want to lose the flow, the creative flow that a, an actor is in you know, to, to create these, these scenes. Um, and he's no nonsense. He doesn't sit around wanting to talk endlessly about how it works. He just wants to see it get up there and let's do it a couple times and and he shoots a lot of coverage so that uh, he, he can work around it. But he also does a lot of great big master shots as well. He is an incredibly underhanded director uh, and it's not for like a lack of effort or anything like that. It's just because he's created a team of people that he trusts illicitly. And uh, you see that and you feel it on set. So it's a very trusting atmosphere where a lot of sets can feel insecure because the director's not sure or this or that or oh, the actors aren't sure or anything like that. Like it was none of that. It was just like effortless like ease and excellence.